Anyway, speaking of a little pussy, nobody that watched this show is going to get any. I'll tell you that. I'm talking about full gear. Full of it. I'll... <laughs> Brian, besides the fact that they, uh, I don't know if this is a new record, but it's certainly on the upper side of even what they do between the hour and a half pre-show show with the big show and the show show that was not even so-so, this thing was five and a half hours. Or did, I mean, I actually put a, a, a clock to it uh, well, my counter on my video as I was progressing through this thing, the uphill schlog, but it, it, good God, and it seemed like longer, but is that the IMAX equivalent? Are they just, we're going to do the same show, but we're going to make it even as long as possible. You know, they've always done long shows. I watched a pre-show from the beginning, so I got to see the Anna J match in front of no one. <laughs> it was really awkward. Yeah, we were the idiots this time still the people in the building. They didn't even show up for it. Well, no, it was Anna Jay. I'm more than happy to watch. But my point okay. was, they've always done long shows. I think the thing about this show that really stood out after a while, especially the second half of the card, every match went 20, felt like it went 30, and the crowd was dead the majority of it. So to me, you could do long shows if you have energy. But the crowd didn't have energy. The matches didn't get people energized. And everything went way too long. I would have rather they had another five matches and had a few of those matches go seven minutes. At least it would have just been different faces doing the same shit. Yeah, no, seriously. I wish they just had a few seven-minute matches. But no, because that doesn't give everyone a chance to express their art. Because they have to go on and on. They just keep on going. Even though the match is blowing on and on, they just keep on going on. See, you didn't know I could croon with the best of them too, did you? Is that what that is? That's crooning? That's, that's crooning right there, baby. Right. I'll have people throwing, well, they can't throw panties at the stage at me. They're, they're, if, they're listening, if they're listening on their phone, just Depends. pull your panty. Pull your panties off and throw them at whoever happens to be sitting around you right now. Coming soon from Arcadian Vanguard Records, Cornette Croons. Well, you know, it, they demand it if they demand it. But speaking of lack of demand, so yes, uh, th this is the point I'm going to make it to start. And we might reiterate some of it as we go on. But Brian, if you've got 12 seven foot guys, you don't have any giants. If you've got 15, 600 pound guys, you got no monsters. It, 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 I, I don't know any plainer ways to state that all of these people, all of these people do all of the same things in all of their matches. And the, all of the booking is doing the same things over and over in the finishes and or et cetera. Is and, it... And, Oh, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm starting to come to a lack of how to clarify that it's just endless because there's no, the only match on this show where any of the heels worked in any way differently, really, than any of the baby faces. It was Bobby Lashley and MJF, and otherwise, it's just an all-out attempted murder for four hours, and I know people will say, well, that makes it exciting. And, and I'm not advocating for 15-minute headlocks that these people think in the in the days of Dick Shickat. You know, the, maybe they held a headlock for 15 minutes, but you can't just do this over and over, week in, week out, pay-per-view in, pay-per-view out, without having personalities that are that are over, that people are interested in, that they think are cool and are stars, and having them interact with each other in an interesting way past constantly either attempting to murder somebody or imagining that you're Johnny Saint. Or, you know, one or the other. And again, in this, in this whole thing, a lot of people are going to say, well, they did, yeah, they did what you told them to. You say all the matches are multi-man matches, so they had mostly singles. Were they, 
Oge now instead of seven or eight guys going to the floor and breaking furniture and fighting all over the arena and trying to fucking kill each other and selling nothing, you've just got two of them. So that that does kind of make it less exciting when you've set up a baseline of we're going to fucking floor this thing and blow the engine out till we hit the wall. So th that's... <laughs> You know, I think that's one of the reasons why, and uh, I'm either, uh, I'm not trying to jump on the review if we're going to get to that right away, but, you know, the match with Big Boom AJ and uh, Big Justice. Yes, and yes. And the Rizzler. These guys were over with those fans almost as much as any of the AEW people were. And I thought that match was fascinating because, I'm not saying it was good, but <laughs> I thought it was fascinating. It was good for the room. Yes. But I thought it was fascinating because you talk about everyone working the same kind of match. Every single match on this show, everyone kicked out of everything. There were multiple matches where it's like, that's the perfect time to go to the finish, and they kept going. And more people just <laughs> kicked out of anything. Again, all you need to do is lift up your arm. No matter how much you weigh, no matter what you look like, if you could do that, that's it. Just let someone kick you in the face and just lift up your arm every minute. That's all it takes. The Big Boom AJ match was like an indie match. It was like one of those matches on one of those dentist shows, like, you know, the, the principal will be in the corner or, you know, it was just something yes. that got no, the it, place going. So I'm saying it wasn't a technical masterpiece and it was with modern pseudo celebrities or whatever. They've made themselves apparently a pretty big following. I don't, I don't have any I don't familiarity have any with idea them. either. I don't know why cookies are involved. I don't know why the drizzler is, I don't know what this whole boom thing is but also it was their hometown it wasn't like they they're from you know uh, oshkosh wisconsin and they just showed up in newark and were over like crazy that's their home area well, and they, they got their people to come i, 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 I don't know how much of its home the, area though because i think well, they live in florida even though they're from jersey originally but south jersey well, well point is that i think they had one of the the noted Jersey press agents and publicity mongers up there in their corner. I'll tell you that. Uh, but, but no, the point being, it, they had a match. I wrote down, it's a, it's a county fair match. It's, it's basic. And it's like you said, if the high school principal or the local sponsor was either in the corner or in the match, or you were working, I've, I got visions of Lawler working with radio DJs. Right? And it worked because yeah, people yeah, exactly. went there to see this guy. And it's, I don't know how old he is. They said he wrestled 25 years ago. Well, goddamn. He's got to be in his he, early 50s. Even then, you know, then he didn't, he looks, the thing is, he was bigger than most of the guys on the fucking AEW roster. And it was basic shit. And he hadn't been in the ring in 20 years, but goddamn, he didn't, he didn't offend anybody with either his appearance or his, but I mean, the kid doing this, I gotta, I'm never going to go on record as saying 12 year olds ought to be doing the spear, even if he did, does have considerable fucking ballast behind it. Yeah, even if he's bigger than half the roster. You well, yeah, the, the, the kid. Um, yeah. Yes. And, uh, but, but anyway, otherwise, the death of people like this, and I think they, they liked Osprey and, uh, what else did they like? Well, we'll we'll go as we go through it. But but that match, but that's that it, match got the room though. And you know what? It should have been on the main show. If this guy's such a social yeah. media celebrity and he got them a bunch of publicity and was able to walk into various places and get on TV to get publicity for this show, why wasn't this on the main card? <laughs> that's I don't because here and we'll get to this also. But the, one of the matches on the card, they had. They should have had that match on TV and then did what they did on TV on pay-per-view. Maybe I don't fucking know, but in a lot of cases they will fall into something and then back up on it. I don't know if 600,000 people watch the, watch the Wednesday night program these days. And they're probably selling what now is it a hundred thousand pay-per-views old, uh, Bleacher Report went out of business or whatever happened there. Um, 
According to AEW, again, we've never had any concrete pay-per-view numbers, and I have reason to think they've maybe been inflated at times. Well, but many, many have come from Uncle Dave himself. And he doesn't have concrete now. Again, even Dave says, you know, he gets estimates from... Well, no, he has sources that he believes highly. They give him estimates. They don't give him, like, this is the exact number. (laughs) I'm trying to be sarcastic, though. He has sources. He he can believe his sources that tell him how great his sources are, but go ahead. I have something controversial to say. Based on watching this pay-per-view event and seeing the card and knowing the roster and the sorry state of things, and also knowing that you need to do things different and... Sometimes you need energy on these shows. You can't just have fans sitting there. You can hear everyone farting because everyone's so quiet. I think give Big Boom AJ a Tim Storm-style run at the (laughs) AEW Championship and let him go over Moxley. Let that be the end of the Moxley shit. Who would have thought that was coming? Moxley gets speared by a 12-year-old and his dad pins him. (laughs) And then you get him on TV everywhere. And then he can drop the belt to Bobby Lashley at some point or something, but it'll tell a story that people will get behind. Hold on, people say I never admit it when I make a mistake. Well, I'm going to admit it right now. I am going to go on record as as supporting a 12-year-old spear and a fucking guy <laughs> if it's Moxley and, and his dad beats him. I'll, I'll go for that. That's the way you can get around, too. No one could beat up Marina Shafir. What if it's a kid? What if the kid tackles Marina Shafir? That's true because, okay, a, 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 a kid fucking underage child of either gender trumps a fucking hitting a female that's an adult. Right. Right, because we've got with the rules in wrestling are that the heel manager is the weakest of all, and then a babyface manager is still not as strong as a heel wrestler, but he's goddamn better than a heel manager, and, and on and on. So if if a child of either gender attacks an adult woman, it's okay. If Big Justice saw that Marina Shafir was about to hit his dad with a, with a briefcase or something, and he just ran there and speared her or hit her in the head with a chair. He's a kid. He gets, you get away with it until you show some facial hair. Then you're fucked. Then it's like, no, nah, he looks old enough. You know, if they could special effect it <laughs> to where when he went to spear her, his head just went <laughs> straight up between her legs and his rest of his body sticking out and she's like a, a fucking hoisted on... His petard right there, that would be fucking hilarious. And then they'd have to call AAA to pull him out of because of the suction. The kid's as big as Marina and Pac, so then you just have to worry about Claudio. But again, oh. I, I'm all for it. Get the belt off Moxley. I think at that point, Claudio would just go home. It's about time. Get the belt off Moxley. None of this is working. <laughs> Nobody likes the way this is going except one person. And put it on Big Boom AJ and get on Fox News and get on Channel 5 News and get on Twitter and pick, pick pack, TikTok and everything yeah. else. Get everywhere with that. That will get you a different kind of thing as opposed to, hey, it's the WWE's other company. It's the other WWE. It's the lesser WWE. You don't want that. Uh, well, I'll tell you. I don't. It, it, here's another question I want to ask. Since we're on the celebrity train... Get on board the celebrity train. They're in Newark, New Jersey. I mean, a Hollywood elite are flocking to Newark there. At least they had eventually, not when the countdown show started, but eventually they had a decent crowd for them these days. So they could actually do a wide shot once in a while. I think they were over 10,000. It was probably their best show domestically in... In a very long time. They did a really good job, actually. Yeah, well, and, and also it's a pay-per-view in a metropolitan area. Of what What is that up there now, Brian? You're you're technically almost in it. About 12 million people. There's a lot of people up here, but I think the most impressive thing was the last week. I think when we did the preview, there was only like 6,000 tickets distributed, and it ended up being a lot more than that. So that's a pretty good walk-up. They usually, I guess that's something Big. they've done before in the New York market, because they've done that with Grand Slam, didn't they? Where one year there was Boom AJ. Big Boom AJ. Now, you know, here's what the thing is, though, in all honesty, and this kind of is on a bigger scale for a national show like this, but it's the same thing happening in the territories. When it's hot, people want to buy advanced tickets because they don't want to end up. I mean, I went to Cincinnati one time to see Mid Atlantic Wrestling. One time. It was their debut in the fucking market, right? At Cincinnati Gardens. And 
I had seen what Jared had done when he tried to go in there a year beforehand, and we just wa- drove on up and said, well, we'll get a ticket at the fucking door. And there was 8,500 people there. We got a ticket up in the goddamn nosebleed section. But when the when people know when it's cooled off and if they're not drawing, they can wait till the last couple of days, make sure they want to go, decide they want to go. Also, they can buy, in a lot of cases, general admission ticket. And if it's not such a great house, they can wander down into the better seats and nobody's going to fuck with them. That type of thing happens also. So, But then if it's something that they end up wanting to go to, you get a bigger walk-up. But remember, we've been talking about that. The The advance sale for the territory days used to be 25 or 30% of what your house would be. Whereas now it's like fucking 90% or whatever. Anyway, but speaking of while we're still in, in Hollywood, who is Paul Walterhausen? I've seen his name uh, in reports on wrestling. Actor or a TV star, or however they describe him, Paul Walter Hauser. I never knew what he looked like, and now that I know what he looks like, what the fuck has he been on to be famous? He was in one of the seasons of Karate, or uh, Karate Kid, Cobra Kai, but he was like the worst character on that show, and they didn't bring him back. And I think it was he played Richard Jewell in that movie they made about the Olympic bombing in Atlanta. Oh, oh, well, yes, yes. I know. I actually would know of what a picture of the actual Richard Jewell would look like. But I've never seen this fucking guy. Well, and then other than that, we've heard that he's a big wrestling fan. He's appeared on AEW before. I think he's, if not pro wrestling gorilla, one of the Southern California indies. He's a, he's a regular there. And that's obviously, you know, what he was dressing to here was dressing to going to these shows. But, uh, <laughs> you know, AEW embracing celebrity. I mean, that's something WWE does. Well, okay, but how are we defining? Wait a minute. Celebrity. Hold on. American Heritage Dictionary. Let me just see how we're defining celebrity these days. Because, I, again, I think Big Boom AJ is a bigger celebrity than this guy. He's supposed to have been on fucking television. I think so, too. And actually, that's part of the thing. I think social media, there's more people that are celebrities now amongst podcasters and just social media content creators than actual movie stars and TV stars. Because who watches fucking TV and stuff? Well, I watch TV, but at the same time, I don't keep track of every goddamn person that's played every bit role and underneath part on every television show ever. Hold on here. I was looking up celebrity. Celibate. Oh, I have to figure that out later. That's uh, ceaseless. Um, celery. Celeb. Cele- celebrated. Celebrate. Celebrity. A famous person. Or renown. Fame. I don't know that some of these people fit celebrity. Nevertheless, we'll move on. It's a lower bar to fucking limbo under than He normal. certainly added a lot. <laughs> Only if there was a weight limit on the fucking podium there. Anyway, the, the, the aforementioned Anna J match, I started to say Anna Sky. She was Joe and Bill's daughter, Anna Sky. Anna J wrestled Deanna Perrazzo, who we had just said, have we seen her in like six months? And boom! Like monkeys, they jump on our commands when they, they oh, they got, we got to book Deanna now. Did you watch the match? You watched the match because of Anna Jay. Did you see the phantom bump? They weren't in Lewiston, Maine, but goddamn, this is the answer to the phantom punch. Yeah, I saw everything. Again, I watched it. I'm not saying it was a technical classic or technically sound or very good or technically there no i i didn't watch the rest of it i don't know but i couldn't reach i had something in my hand uh, possibly petting harley i could reach the remote in time about 30 seconds in they were doing a spot where apparently aj just forgot to hit her and diana perrazzo just fucking went down 
And Anna J was looking like, oh shit, should I have done something? There? She just ran up to her and boom. She went out. Like, what the fuck? I watched it in slow motion. There was no contact of anything. There was no blow thrown or attempted. It was just like she just kind of ran toward her and boom. And then I moved along. Who won that contest? Do you remember? Um, the right cheek or the left cheek? You know, I actually uh, don't remember who won. I, they uh, had uh, Taya Valkyrie at ringside. She's now. Was that who that was? She's apparently aligned with Deanna Peraza now. Yeah, that was Taya Valkyrie. Where would that? She changed her hair and her completely different look. Everything. I did not know that was her. Well, son of a gun. Those fans weren't there yet, so they missed it too. But uh, well, they also go go ahead. No, Anna Jay's just yeah. You know, sometimes you just see someone you're like that person needs to run off to the south of France with me for like two weeks. Moving on. <laughs> so we had a four-way match where a Martin brother, I can't remember which one he is. Dante. Uh, it was Dante. Dante. Wrestled rigor mortis against Commander, against Buddy Matthews. Again, they expect people to take Buddy Matthews seriously in this heel group that they have going on that is now has what are they the house of the kings of the black throne of people well no they're the house of black but the kings of the black throne are a subsect of the house a subsidy a wholly owned subsidiary potato never that well, the point is why why is buddy matthews in a four-way with job guys on a pre-show and look, again, look at the, the athlete he is and the way he can work. And he's got a shitty fucking name that I would change in a heartbeat when I found him some kind of gimmick where you could present him as a people, as somebody would go out and fucking break people's necks for a daily habit and get him away from his supernatural mumbo jumbo hocus pocus that Malachi Boring has thrust everybody in. But they had that match. And then they they had the aforementioned, and we've talked a bit about it, but we got to provide some details. The, the 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 big AJ Big Boomer fellow, Big Boom AJ and Big Justice, and they brought out Paul White still works there, and bless him for it. What are they having him do? What is he allowed to do? Why have we not seen him in, what, two years? Does he do something on another show? Is he on Rampage? He was on one of the internet shows, I think, when they had those. He was better on commentary than all the regular commentators. But yeah, well, because their they're regular commentators are not actually regular commentators. They're, on, they're, they're not in up to the median standard, but... You know, so they brought him out to do the color on <laughs> the Costco match. And I don't know how the, the, the Drizzler, Rizzler, what is the Rizzler? The Rizzler. What, what is the gimmick of the, I mean, he's another one of the, the member of the family, but why is he the Rizzler? I'm not exactly sure, but give him credit. He stayed in complete gimmick the whole time. Well, yes, he's he's carefully, you know, he's invested in his case. He's gone to the method acting school. I think he's doing some Strasburg there. But so A.J. Boomer brought the boom. And at the start, the the big show was there so that he could back QT down when Q, QT went to menace the Rizzler. And I mean, and they, they had a a basic spot show territory wrestling match where the chances of the guy who hasn't wrestled in twenty years and, and then obviously not at a worldwide level won't go fuck anything up. So people either shit on it or didn't feel good for him because they were predisposed to like him. And the heel tries to guide the ship and become the foil for the, you know, the people to laugh at him and more or less. And besides the, the kid doing, getting to do a spear on a grown man, I'd have even taken a kick in the balls. <laughs> Maybe QT didn't want to volunteer for that fucking chunky little son of a bitch to kick him in the balls. 
Uh, but otherwise than that, that's what they did. They had a basic match, and the fucking babyface powerbombed him. One, two, three. And they could, again, they got a reaction, not only because of who was in it, and they were, uh, you know, wanting to like the guy, but also because nobody really fucked anything up and was embarrassing or, you know, it took a phantom bump that I saw. I didn't watch it like the Zapruder film, but I think they at least tried to halfway swing at the guy when he fell down. Brian, did I miss any Invisible Man tactics? I mean, AJ threw better punches than half the roster. Could probably get yeah, and, and again, the bar is the low, but, yeah. but there you are, yeah. You know, again, this goes back to that argument for years about what is good wrestling. And you would go to some of these indie shows here in New Jersey. And, you know, for a long time, you didn't get... If you got, like, one match with one high flyer, you were lucky. You know, Devin Storm stood out immediately on those Dennis shows because he was, like, trying to do crazy shit that he couldn't even do yet. I saw him do an Asai Moonsault land on his head. He yeah. wasn't right, but he was trying it. But you got a lot of matches similar to this. That, like I said about the Anna J match, not a technical classic, but the difference is you get the room into it. Everyone there seemed to be as invested in the finish of this as in the finish of any other match on the show. Which is insane. <laughs> but it says something, too. It, was, the, it wasn't just people. a celebrity, it was the kind of match they tried to do. Yeah, it, it was the, it's the people involved. You know, if you say, hey, we're going to have a fucking show on Saturday night where Joe Bob Smith and Billy Bob Briggs are going to beat each other with light tubes. You could hold it in a fucking basement. But if you say, we're going to have a show at this goddamn giant building where uh, The Rock and Conor McGregor are going to fucking trade insults with each other, you probably sell 10,000 fucking tickets. And, and, I'm, and I'm not trying to put the rock over, but you know what I'm saying? It's who the people are and whether they're good, have a reputation for being somewhat good in that field. And they're, they're over, people know them, and they're stars. And they have a, an issue. And they can, instead of just endless, indie-rific shit, that instead of a rec center or a high school gym, it's in a goddamn major building because somebody wanted to spend quarter of a billion fucking dollars on it. But it, they, this is the reason why that they're contracting an audience, whether they're expanding financially with money to people who pay them to fart in church. That's one thing. But whether they're getting an audience to watch and come and see and whatever and making stars and celebrities out of their guys and their talent. And, uh, uh, no. Because it's just over and over. Over and over. Anyway, we'll move on to the pay-per-view. Big Boom AJ and uh, Big Justice and the Rizzler. Yes. Is now the time to hold Tony up for more money and say, if not, I'm calling Nick Khan. He sees what we did. E I think there may be a ceiling to the celebrity level of of AEW of of a well of WWE <laughs> that they might want Big Boom and the and the cast to fill out a few more applications before they get to that that point. I don't know. You know that is one of the things that's interesting to think about. WWE has embraced a lot of social media celebrities. They've embraced celebrities we've never heard of. Remember Sexy Red? Apparently she has well, a following, yeah. and they got. They've actually, under Paul Levesque, it seems like they've tried, or under, I don't know if that's actually a Paul Levesque call, but they've tried to incorporate any celebrity or pseudo-celebrity they can. But well, anyway. then maybe there might be a bidding war for the, the boom war. War, of, war for the boom. To what I said earlier, do you think this match should have been on the main pay-per-view show, considering the what? interest and the attention from the fans? Yes, especially if they were going to do it, why wouldn't you fucking do it? They put it, It's not even, like you said, for the local market, they put these guys on national TV on Dynamite and said, we're going to have this match at this thing. 
so it's not like they were trying to hide it and just do it in Newark and nobody else would know about it. So I, yeah, again, so that, that's it would have been weird different than yeah. everything on the main show. And they, you would have seen people jumping up and down a little bit. Well, that was the big match on the pre-show. And then we went right into a World Tag Team Championship four-way match. And, all right, if it, hold on. They had the entrances on the pre-show. So, again, shorting the people who just tuned in to see what they paid for. Uh, but it was the House of the Black Throne Kings, the Outrunners, the Acclaimed, and Private Party, who got strippers for or dancers. They didn't take it. They had already taken almost everything off. They didn't take anything off on camera. What do you call it when you go out there semi-buck naked anyway? You're not a stripper. Are you a, a fucking exhibitionist? I, 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 You're asking me what do you call that in-between thing between well, where being they've a just stripper got, and, I don't know what you're saying. Actually. They've just they've just got <laughs> way too little on to be appropriate in public where children are present, but at the same time they're not really taking anything off because they're already there. So they can't be a stripper. Hmm. Let us know, cult of Cornet yeah. members, what the term would be. And send photos. And send these so that we get an idea of visual representation of what but anyway, uh <laughs> So now are they doing something where Caster is turning on Bowens or are they just really mad at each other? What is happening here? It seemed to be that. I mean, from the very beginning, he threw the microphone at him and then there were a few moments <laughs> in the match. Bowens is on TV all the time again because those PC Richards commercials he filmed a few years ago are airing again <laughs> for the holidays and it ends with Bowens crossing his arms and smiling for like five seconds. So uh, <sighs> he's all over New York TV. And it appears to be that they are doing that. And you know what? It's probably time to do that. If you're going to do anything else with Max Caster, let alone Anthony Bowens, you got to do it. You're running out of time. Well, he, you know, he did his rap, and, but instead of the everybody loves the best or everybody loves the acclaimed, he said everybody loves the best wrestler alive. And then he didn't just pitch the microphone at Bowens. He sidearmed it at him like he wasn't fucking stick it down his throat. And I was like, what the fuck? And it, it, if they're working, it, 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 they did a good job because it almost looked like they'd had an argument before they went out there and he's there, motherfucker, boom. So they did a good job. Or maybe next week they'll be happy on TV and, and I was right. They just <laughs> got pissed at each other. But anyway, a uh, private party beat Caster in about 20 minutes. Uh, I, 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 that's really, cause we got a lot of ground to cover and it's a four way tag team match. And that's the way they start to show off. Well, they actually started the introductions to the match before the show, the pre-show well, yeah, got the entrance. That, yeah. the entrances. Yes. So, so that's why I said to some of the people who just watched the pay-per-view didn't get all that they paid for because they put the, Oh, I never even made my fucking point earlier. You just distractified me. You son of a gun. If 600,000 people are watching the Wednesday night TV and there are uh, 100,000 people are buying a pay-per-view, how many people are watching the hour and a half before the pay-per-view? We One would think significantly less unless you, you know, sit there for another hour and a half and I have to go in and record. When I buy the pay-per-view, I have to record earlier stuff also without... Or instead of, if I'm DVRing the pay-per-view to get the pre-show, I have to back up and purposely record that also. So the point is, it's the smallest viewership that they put Big Boom AJ and the crew on. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. I should have made that point then. Yeah, you have to wonder how many people tuned in thinking that match, if they got anybody who wasn't a normal AEW pay-per-view buyer, and I don't know that they do, but if they do, if this generated some interest, how many realized that it wasn't actually on the pay-per-views? On the well, yeah. On Wednesday night, they said, yeah, he's got it at full gear. So 30 people in Des Moines, because they've got a big Costco enclave there, they buy the pay-per-view and they missed it. And they're out 50 bucks because they put it... <sighs> 
Anyhow, um, I have realized what listening to Pockets try to do a wrestling promo sounds like. What's that? It's like listening to an insurance salesman talking about the new medical plan they want to fucking sell you. You just tune it out because it's it's coming from that face and with no sincerity, which is allegedly part of his gimmick that five years in has never been explained, justified, whatever description you want to give. And this this was the guy that's in the main event for the world title. If you are a a WWE fan, and as we've said, there's more of them numerically, statistically, empirically provable, or if you're a fan of any kind of wrestling in the past 50 years, and you look at some of these people, you're like, what the fuck is this bullshit? And you wouldn't give it a chance. And I, I just, I don't know what they're thinking. Uh, <clears throat> Did you notice what our boy MJF did again this time? What he did again this time? What do you mean? No. Yes. He got in and got out before he got any on. Oh, yeah. Usually, I mean, a few times he's been in the opening match. He got, what, the second match here for the Yes, yeah, well, because he knew that at least nothing was going to register out of the four-way. But, uh, you know, that got him in their seats and everything. But he doesn't go on eighth after everybody's taking chainsaws to people because he is the he's the star of the show in the ring and I'm not talking about how he's being used and he's the only one that really works differently than everybody else and kind of gets you up because he makes you think about what you're looking at so he goes in early before the Indy-rific bunch kills the crowd by, you know, breaking up enough furniture to have a bonfire. And then the problem is he's wrestling Roddy, but as we've now come to find out, even as badly as Roderick Strong has been maliciously booked since he's been there, because Adam Cole just fell apart, the the people like Roddy better now than they like Adam. And Roddy can outperform him. And they don't like Roddy. And they don't really like Roddy, but they, they got into this. <laughs> because MJF, it, everybody else is out there trying to hit a couple notes on a goddamn, you know, piano. But MJF is in the back playing a cello or a violin where he hits the subtle notes. And he knows how to get the most out of shit without killing himself. Because he's he knows how to work. And Roddy, Roddy obviously can't manage him, or manage him, match him in a cunning linguist category for the promos. But Roddy can work seriously and lay shit in in his physical and a blah, blah, blah. He just needs a direction of where he's supposed to be, what he's supposed to be doing when he's being booked somehow, which this has just all been nonsense. But nevertheless, I think I said beforehand I was probably going to like this match just as a match better than anything else and pretty much did. It may have, again... Did they need the last four or five minutes? Or I don't mean the last four or five minutes. Take that out. I mean, just shorten it up where they got to the meat of the matter and got to finish in in four or five less minutes. But again, MJF is the only different guy with the attitude, the facials, the tactics. He sells like a heel and his offense works like a heel. And it, the the match made sense in terms of you know, again, nobody kicked out of that I saw of a tombstone pile driver onto the, you know, landmine left there in World War II. And Roddy, at some points, you know, he's laying his shit in, MJF. His shit looks good, and he doesn't spam it, as the kids say. And then finally, the only thing I didn't understand was the finish, and I will 
Illustrate it, Brian, and you tell me what I missed. Roddy's making his comeback, blah, blah, blah. He's hit a couple of big moves. He's hit the big kick. And MJF, boom, took a bump on the one move, bump on the other move, bump on the kick, and then Roddy goes for a suplex, and MJF just picked him up and brain-bustered him. After he'd been hit with these three fucking things. And then when they both sold the brain buster, then Roddy's the one that rolled over and got his arm over the top of him, got a two count. And he's the one that just got brain bustered. And then as he put the arm on him and got the two count, MJF grabbed Roddy's arm and rolled over and got the arm bar and made him tap right there. So what was I missing about the continuity of that sequence of events? I'm not sure. It really came out of nowhere. I know MJF's one matches like out of nowhere in the past with like a nut shot or something, but this was pretty quick and it just happened. And it was different than the other matches on the show that just went nonstop, finish after finish, but it seemed rather abrupt. It well, they were they were building something there, but I'm not saying that it's not a good finish that if Roddy had 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 him covered with one arm for him to kick out and get the arm. I'm saying that MJF is the one that just brain bustered Roddy after MJF had been hit with three big things. And then Roddy's the one that rolled over and covered. So something, something happened there. Anyway, then MJF, of course, because he's just made the guy tap out, he wants to break his arm. So he goes and gets a chair and he puts Roddy's hand in the chair and he stomps it. And then Adam Cole's music plays. But here comes Adam Cole, Kyle O'Reilly, Matt Taven, and Mike Bennett. And they hit the ring. So MJF runs off through the crowd. And I was wondering why, because O'Reilly already told everybody that MJF was just going to kill them. He said, oh, don't fuck with him. He's going to kick the shit out of all of us. But he took off. And then Kyle O'Reilly is pissed off and he shoves Adam Cole down on his ass. And he's, it's your fault. I told you this was going to happen. He's going to hurt this guy. He's going to hurt. He's going to fuck all of us up. Is this a revolutionary new strategy to get a heel over by having the baby faces fight amongst themselves about quit fucking with this guy? <laughs> or is this a revolutionary way to end the MJF Adam Cole feud? <laughs> It just ends because the other guy's mad that it's happening. But I mean, what is our, is it now, is, is Kyle going to join with MJF because these numb nuts is over here, won't listen to him. And then we're going to have tag team matches play up, but with, with who, with <laughs> Cole and pick one of these other fucking sorry losers. MJF MJF has to be unglued from all of this. <laughs> Quick. He's, Quickly. I think somebody's sniffing the glue. And by the way, I'll, yeah. sa I'll say, because I noticed it with MJF, although that's part of his gimmick, I think, because it's been going on from the beginning. But Roddy, Adam Cole, everyone on this show, appreciate everything. Who does the spray tans for AEW? Because <laughs> they probably need to be fired. <laughs> Everyone's orange or yellow. I know the the Simpsons character look or and make make the fucking guys pull their knee pads down. It may happen in the match. Oh, but anyway, I'm, I'm just can you imagine Dusty Rhodes be telling Nikita Koloff and Barry Windham and the Road Warriors, hey, let's not fuck with that fucking flair. He's going to kick his shit out of all of us. Well, you know what was up next, Brian? The long-awaited women's championship, or one of the women's title matches. What title does Mercedes Moan have that she was putting up against Chris Statlander? The, it's the TBS title. I believe so. I believe TBS and New Japan Women's Strong. Oh, Jesus. Is it Women's Strong or Strong Women's? Strong Women. Well, it ought to be Strong Women. You don't want to put it on any weak women. <laughs> That's not what I was saying. But so... <laughs> <laughs> you know, these weak women are a big problem in in the world today. Uh, speaking of weak women, Camille has been told to watch from the back. Just what the fuck is Is she really hurt? Uh, or uh, or th do they think this is going to make her a big baby face? Well, they're sadly mistaken, but I, even if she was really hurt, 
you wouldn't do this, but if, if she's not hurt and she just got the sling on, uh, I... Uh, <sighs> oh. Anyway, as a matter of fact, there was a sign in the match early on, free Camille across from the hard camera. Because we'd rather see her than Mercedes Mo This is the only person on this roster that I get the, the opinion of, that even the AEW fans are booing her not because they know she's a heel and they're supposed to and they like that, but that they're booing her legitimately with some emotion like we don't want to see you please don't talk anymore is that the way it comes off to you or is she just doing it when they do make any reaction at all is this revolutionary heel work or just oh fuck no not you again i think that's been the general reaction this night was a little different because i think the match won over the room a little bit by the end so for a moment, they got past the, we don't want to see Mercedes Monet, but she did the match that everyone else did on the show. You kick out of every single thing that looks like it would have killed you. And it worked for that room. Well, so, I but think, you know, so I think for a little, for a little period of time there, they put away their Mercedes Monet sickness because they enjoyed the match. Well, I was talking about when she came out and first interacted with people anyway, but they, the match was as these things go for Mercedes, better than normal, you know why? It's the fucking Linda Miles principle. In reverse. In that, remember I always told Linda Miles was not only so awkward and green, but she was so big that the other girls couldn't move her around. Well, this is the opposite. Statlander, for all of the gimmick changes she's gone through and you know she disappears and reappears and they do this and that and the other thing we don't know what the fuck's going on she turned baby face with no explanation got she, rid of her yeah, manager with no explanation just things just happen and we're not clued in on it but the point is she's pretty good and she's big enough to move mercedes around and to fucking sometimes get in the right place or put her in the right place and the the thing I didn't like about the match is, again, we know Mercedes is going to win, or at least we were pretty sure. And wouldn't you know who won the pony? But that Statlander, to try to make her, they cut her off too quick. Mercedes worked with her like they were equal size, and they were just doing moves back and forth. And because Mercedes doesn't probably know how, she's never been in any real wrestling environment how a little chicken shit heel like her should work with a big baby face and and uh, again with mercedes going over statlander should have had quite a bit of the match but instead they kind of did the deal that a lot of the indie wrestlers talk themselves into well i'll just I'll give you everything and you I still won't beat you and that'll make you so strong. Well, no, it just makes the whole fucking match phony. Uh, but also, no, you see what I'm saying? I think Statlander should have had a little more of the match. Uh, again, Mercedes overacts horribly at the two counts with the screaming and the gripping of her. She's flipping her wig almost is what she's doing. Why doesn't a baby face use the wig as a weapon? We know now she's wearing a wig. Just go for the wig. Every move yeah. should just be like, I'm going to get you in a headlock because I'm going to rip this fucking thing off your head. See, man, well, and it, I know pulling hair is illegal, but if it's fake hair. Yeah, how does that work in terms of the rules? Is a wig covered under the don't pull hair rule? Well, but then no, it would be covered under the uh, you cannot pull tights rule because it's uh, the pull tights rule is also any part of the opponent's apparel cannot be pulled in such a fashion. You know, this match is one of the times on this show where I felt like they almost had a moment where they have, if they had done something different than what they did, the fans would have gone ape shit. Yeah. And the fans, again, it wasn't the booking, the fans were ready to go crazy for Statlander if she won. Obviously, she didn't, but it seemed like the fans got... It seemed like the longer it went, the more fans thought that in the room that maybe Statlander was going to win. Maybe. And as a matter of fact, I swear to God, I'm just looking at the notes I made. More kickouts. Um, 
If Mercedes worked the, the bad leg, splashed the knee, and got a two count, I'm not sure what the fuck was going on there. But I, then I wrote, fans are hoping Statlander will win. And again, it's, you know, you can't say this crowd is straight baby face and heel. They just like Statlander better. But then after all of that, you know, Mercedes again did all kinds of things, meteoras and the like, and all that fancy stuff. And then Statlander picks her up for a tombstone. And Mercedes bites her leg to get out of it, which is kind of cool, but she goes over backwards and picks her up and th or does some kind of flip or whatever the point is. She threw Statlander into the second rope, throat first in, in name only, in description only, really, and then covered her awkwardly one, two, three. After these, they're jumping up after fucking top rope goddamn have a coronas and all these major moves and this little bitty not only the little bitty girl that is reversing around Statlander's tombstones and shit but then this little tuck into the ropes and a fucking awkward cover I was like <sighs> it, it maybe it worked in rehearsal do you think it could have been something else you know I'm not exactly sure when she went throat first that was a bit unique. And then again, boom, right to the finish. But she went in with the, the force of a granny driving to church on Sunday. Coming, it, off, it, coming, coming off, off of what they had done before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing. They just did that flash finish with MJF. And then all of a sudden right here, you know, it was a night of the heels winning. <laughs> it was a night of AEW saying fuck you to the Northeast fans and the heels won other than Big Boom AJ. Well, but not actually, it depends on who you think the heels are. Because have we determined that? Because the next match, light switch Jay White and hangnail Adam Page. Oh, you know, you know who's the heel in this match? The timekeeper. <laughs> why wasn't this a 10 minute match why did this have to go as long as it went oh good lady. 20 fucking minutes well no more than 20 minutes uh but it was any match on the card less interesting to people to begin with i can't remember why jay white is a baby face after he was a heel for so long and then gone and then he was hurt and Juice was hurt. And, and then <laughs> th this match, again, was it falls count anywhere? Was it no disqualification? Was it lazy booking? What was it? They just went out on the floor and fought in the entranceway and on the floor for, for minutes and weren't counted out. And... It just went on and on with moves back and forth, and people were kind of staring, except when, again, if somebody chops, they get to woo. They like that. And then after really just having a match for a long time, they countered each other's finishes back and forth a time or two into Jay White's, and Jay White beat him one, two, three. So which got Hangnail a, which got a good stock pop. has fallen. Which got a good pop. Well, yeah, because they they're like, they didn't expect it. And it came after just boring. I mean, it was the quietest match. You're not even really... I mean, there were times at home it was really quiet. You hear sometimes where people in the reading are like, oh, the fans are really into everything. Well, I mean, they were dead silent. But at least they came up for the finish, I guess. But again, you know... <laughs> When the matches start getting so repetitive, but, you know, it's like, would it make the, a lot of people are going to say, well, when they have up and down the match where, or up and down the card matches where they fight on the floor forever, the referee just stares, they use objects, people come in, even if it's not just no disqualification, but then they'll just make it no DQ and there's no rules in this match, no rules in that match to make it more exciting. Okay, what about if in the NBA Finals, Brian, or maybe even the, the March Madness, the NCAA, the inbounds pass, when the guy catches it, he doesn't have to dribble. 
he can just tuck it under his arm and just run down the court, and he doesn't have to dribble. That would make it more exciting. What about if everybody else trying to stop him instead of guarding him or trying to draw a charge, they could just fucking drag him down and tackle him. That would make it more exciting. And then, you know, what about if his teammates were allowed to block for him? That would make basketball much more exciting, wouldn't it? But that's not how you play that fucking game. So if, if to have any anything register that is out outside the norm, you have to have a norm. To have any heel cheat and get heat for it, you have to have rules for him to break. To have anybody get over by doing a specific outrageous thing, such as bleeding or fighting on the floor or whatever the case, you can't have everybody do it in every fucking match. And I mean, to the point where how many matches have we seen lately where there's multiple tables broken in the same match and then more tables broken in matches after that? Is it, that's, then that's the norm, and the norm is that the, just everything happens all the time. And then you tune it out. So, anyway, that's, uh, and I thought that Paige's stock has fallen here, possibly, because does anybody think that Jay White at this point is ever going to mean anything here? That ship has sailed if it was going to happen to begin with. I mean, it'll mean more than, you know, the the legless boy or whatever the fuck. But, I mean, anything in the way of actually moving needle, drawing money, getting ratings, that ship has sailed a long time ago because he's not new anymore. But now Paige is doing a job for him. I'm wondering if Hangnail... And, but now later on, is he is he switching babyface again? This antisocial cowboy? Let's save the end stuff to the end because I don't completely understand and I don't think they do either whatever they were trying to do, so there's a lot to break down there, but... By, by the time that we get to it, it may have changed again, is what you're saying. But, you know, this was in the middle, you know, of when that streak started with the mercedes Monet match. Every match was like 20 minutes, at least. Yes. Other than the Lashley match, every match went 20 minutes, but to me, this one felt a lot longer. <laughs> because of how quiet it got and just what they were doing, it felt like it took forever to get to the finish. All I kept thinking was, what would I do if I went to a show like this? And I was like, would I be able to hold up a sign that said, go home, or would they take it from me? And <laughs> I would just constantly hold up, go home, go home. <sighs> or the, the other way that the boys used to say it, it's Miller time. Anyway, uh, oh, and then Adam Page left. No, what did he do? He, no, he, he, that's uh, uh, Jay White left, and then Page went and leveled him on the ramp, and then Chris Daniels came out. Be like, why do you want to do that to that guy? And then he knocked out Christopher Daniels. So that, that'll be at least a fine, uh, according to Sockface, to knock out Jeez. the fuck. Remember when Chris Daniels was the, the voice of the voiceless or the homeless or Tony Khan? I don't know what Clueless. he was. He was Tony Khan's guy that was going to make all the rulings until the next week, and then he never did it again. And again, Chuck Taylor just got taken out by Moxley. Not Chuck Taylor, the wrestler. We were told it was Chuck Taylor, the backstage producer. Yes. And now the almost a general manager doesn't really do anything. <laughs> Role on the show, he gets taken out. It's just there's like no reason for any of the chaos that happens. Wrestling needs chaos at times, but there has to be reason for it. On well, this show, again, there's no reason. Yes, and it happens intermittently, not constantly. But there's going to be repercussions over that. All right, let's get to the, to the big one coming up next between Will Osprey and Kyle Felcher. And, and why does Don Fallis never manage? He, go, he comes he doesn't out know with how this guy to. and he goes, well, no, come on, he, no, he's watched enough TV. It's not he's that He's been simple. around me. Hey, there's plenty of people on that roster that watch a lot of wrestling. Look at how they are on the ring. 
Well, but nevertheless, he's 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 old enough. He could have figured it out. No, he, he goes to, to color, and there's already three guys over there, but he's not actively involved when his man has a match of any kind, which to me diminishes the importance of it because I would only go over and do color when my guys were fighting job guys, and I'd make mockery of them. But nevertheless, is... I know their their wardrobe budget must be endless also, but is Kyle's new wearing apparel, including wearing a crown, is that from somebody in a video game? What video game is that from? I have no idea. Because, I mean, now he's he's gone from the, the blonde-headed kid and then he became a heel and he had an obnoxious blonde hair, but he was putting, trying to put a look together and then he was dressed like Michael Myers in Halloween one week and now and then he shaved his head and he now he's he's the king with the fucking throne and or the crown and I don't know what's going on here but I thought it might be a video game I'm not sure he's definitely you know for someone who has his size he's put on a lot of weight in the right way in the last year you know he's one of the few guys on that roster that they've spent some time on not to say they do anything right. But that he has actually improved his own appearance. Yeah, and he has yeah. a look. Like, you could see him working for WWE because I think he's like 6'5 or 6'4, so he already is taller than half the roster. Well, half. He's taller than the majority of the roster. But uh, no, I think Fletcher's, uh, you know, I, I thought he looked good with the blonde hair as a heel, but I think he's done a good job of growing into being an American wrestler. Well, and that's the thing. That's what I I noted. And the problem, again, is the way that, that they book other people. They're trying to give Kyle a rub and get him over by having him beat a top guy, which that uh, the young guy, guy beating the older established veteran whose name, boom, brings you up. Yes, but the problem is Osprey is the closest chance that they've got at having a star baby face. And the way they've booked him since he's been there, I don't think he's... It, it's just, okay, now you're just another one of the boys when he's getting beat by Kyle, who right now, to me, needs developmental or a territory or something for 18 months, and you could really polish him up instead of doing it every week on TV. Let's add this, take that off, and subtract this, and shave his head. And we're all watching it happen every Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Bring us the finished product after you've tried it out on the road. That would have helped him. And he'd be more polished and he'd probably be more readier for this because he's putting the work in physically and et cetera, like you said. But the same thing is with later on with Swerve and Lashley. It'd be, it'd be great to have this match later. Because the guy just been there for three fucking weeks. And it, but anyway, but the problem is with this match again, they're friends and they're putting it together and nobody's going to tell them what to do. And that's why they did shit that their people would have told them not to do. They, they trade forearms at the bell and then start their spots at 100 miles an hour. And they're doing flips off the stairs a minute in. And Kyle does a great DDT and does great athletic moves and flips and all these big moves and he throws punches like a fucking girl. Things like that. If you, if you could get in a ring with a, a Dick Murdoch who'd make you learn one way or the other. Just a time or two. That's what helped a lot of guys. That, that opportunity doesn't exist anymore. But then Kyle gave Will a brain buster on the floor at four minutes into the match. And bear in mind, they're going past 20. And after the brain buster on the floor, he rolled him in and tried to pin him down with a double finger lock. Did you catch that one? I did. It'd be like a guy trying to run across the interstate being hit by a fucking semi. And when he lands, you'd go over there and you'd fuck, I'm going to smother him just to make sure. What the f So then, you know, he got some heat on Osprey. 
But then after some heat, Osprey just came back and hit a flippy thing off the top to the floor and a forearm off the top. And, and then they stood there and allowed each other to chop them. I don't know how you say that sentence, to be honest with you. Allowed each other to purposely strike the other person without trying to prevent it. And then they started doing big moves, but no, none of them did damage. They might l both lay there and sell after three or four of them for a, a little while and then get up and go 100 miles an hour and never... It, but there's not even time for a guy to take a bump before the other guy would shrug off whatever and does do, do his own big move. And then Osprey gave Kyle a tombstone pile driver on the floor. And at that point, Shivani started plugging the upcoming Continental Tournament. When people would have... On the other channel, they would have been screaming for a fucking ambulance and trying to kick the people out of the building for doing it, and that's why everybody's reacting to it. Over here, within one minute, on the clock, the guy who got tombstone pile driven on the floor was 100% and is back doing big moves at 100 miles an hour. And so they're trying to be a video game because that's their frame of reference of what is cool combat to them because they unfortunately are so young they were not exposed to the wrestling business when they had access to numerous minds that have to would have told them how to fucking do this shit? And how to think about it. So if you could do something special, you can work it into the rules of the game instead of having the NCAA finals where they don't have to dribble and they can tackle the fucking guy with the ball. So then... They were on the apron doing shit back and forth while the referee stared gawkedly at them, and then Felcher gave Osprey a tombstone pile driver off the apron of the ring onto the top of the steel stairs. Yeah, that was a bit much considering, again, the pile driver is kind of out there right now, and not saying you have to honor what another company does, but when another company puts over the pile driver the way they do, and then they do this kind of thing here, I don't know. Should one company, honor is not the right word, but honor what the other company's doing with a move like that? And it's I mean, not even it's not even that. It's honoring logic and the integrity of your business. And why would you do something that's that risky? That also means nothing and is so phony, and people ain't gonna remember it. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have remembered it of all the pile drivers on the floor, except I wrote it down. But the point is, it's not honoring another company's rules or regulations or angles or whatever to if you pick a motherfucker up and drop him from a height on his head on metal or concrete, that he should go down and stay down for a little while. That's the integrity of the goddamn profession. Because it's stupid otherwise. And what... He gave him a tombstone pile driver off the apron of the ring onto the top of the steel stairs and then rolled him in and didn't cover him. He hit a flying knee and then he gave him a front pile driver and got a two count. And now it's just garbage. And I said, that was 22 minutes in. And I said, I'm done. It's horseshit. And I hit the fast forward button. And honestly, two minutes later, not a fast forwarding, but two minutes in actual time, that's where Kyle gave Osprey a brain buster on the top turnbuckle and it covered him one, two, three, and just beat him. So the heel beats the top baby face by not cheating, and the manager doesn't help. But in the middle of the match, they each gave and survived moves and things that were much more devastating. And then, which is kind of like, I don't know what it's kind of like. It's kind of like stupid is what it's kind of like. 
So a, again, there's these the bubble of fans that like this kind of thing thought that this was just tremendous, and this is why that their buildings are emptier and that people are more over when they get there and the people like the idea of them than they are six months later when the people have seen them do all this shit over and over and there's nothing left. Felcher needs developmental, like I said, for 18 months, and Osprey, you know, you can't do a bunch of favors trying to elevate your friend when you've been diminished rather than enhanced since you've been on the television program. And neither one of your characters in a video game. I know you have fun, but what did we say earlier? You know, too many guys are having the match they want to have for the persona that they want to play instead of having a match that the fans will like and understand based on the gimmick that you're working in who you are and what you, how you fill that out, whether you appear visually to look like the gimmick that you are performing. And they don't understand that. They don't understand casting in Hollywood. Maybe we could put it like that. There's certain parts that certain people get cast for in Hollywood because they fit the fucking visual image of that person and others don't get cast in those parts because they don't look the part. That's where that fucking phrase came from. Jump in anytime, Brian. You know, I said this was in the middle of a string of matches where everything went 20 minutes. This went like 25 minutes and I like these <laughs> two and I'm more tolerant of a, you know, new Japan dome finish or, you know, minutes into the finish than you are. But this was too long for me. For these two in the middle of their, you know, early stages of their blood feud. And then for me personally, once the spot on the stairs happened, I was like, this is ridiculous. And I was waiting for the finish at that point. And it took another few minutes. Because <laughs> yeah. that was the, every match from the, you know, for the rest of this card. I'm waiting for the finish and it never comes. And it, there's just more and more and more. Well, but, you know, uh, the other thing is a, a watched pot always rings twice. The other thing is, I think the people there for the main card may have enjoyed this more than anything else. And that hurt everything else after this. Well, yeah, because again, uh, Osprey is the closest thing they've got to a baby face superstar. And everything they do is to, to fight against that, uh, that development. But, uh, you know, and uh, after that, but what, what else can you do after this? They're just uh, uh, people that are uglier and don't look as good physically doing the same kind of fucking shit. Well, again, they mm. followed up that match, that 25 minute match with another match that would go close to 20 minutes. And this was the one where it seemed like the room was dead. I didn't give a shit. Well, well now, wait a minute. Hold on. You're skipping over something. Oh, that's right. And the next match you're talking about, but not the next event. The next event was the champagne bottle celebration with Maria May and Mina. Mina, I'm going to call her my little Mina mouse. She may like she's that. She's so cute. She's like a, a cute little mouse in the corner, right? I think she's the most over woman now on the roster based on the reaction she's getting, which is mainly from shaking her tits. Uh, well, yes. Which yes. is what she says, but I think she's the most over woman on the roster right now. And that's because at least in the middle of all of this repetition and nonstop chaos, the, the, this predominantly male audience can just look over there and there's Mina's memories. But she acknowledges Thanks it. for the memories. But that's what it is. Well, she doesn't pretend. How would she not acknowledge it? No, because every woman in her... wrestling, every woman in wrestling has a fucking wedgie and their tits are hanging out and they're like, no, that's not, I don't have it out there for men to look at. It's because I like wrestling with a wedgie or whatever the fuck it is. She's out there saying, I know you like looking at my tits. Here they are. You like Mina. I like you. Th that's what she's doing. And it works because it's honest. <sighs> it works because it's just something else besides this other nonsense. But this is not the champagne bottle celebration that I saw the 
movie of 30 years ago. I'm not sure if they stole the script because the, the movie, they were speaking in German, but this was not the plot. But they, it, it, if I would say it would be embarrassing for cable access television, but people on cable access television are trying, they have a thought that they're actually trying to get across, so I don't mean to demean them. But Mina, our friend Mina Mellons, see, that'd, that'd be her vivid video name, Mina Mellons. Well, maybe in the 80s and 90s. I think now they've gone past, like, the funny names that are sexual. Now it's like everyone's... What, in porn? I think it's now, like, NXT kind of names. Like, here is... Oh, fuck you that. Know, I Brittany... Want, I want to I wanna see Dick Rambone and fucking Rod... Dick Rambone. Hard Rock. Dick Rambone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so Mina cannot even pronounce the English word. She's like the the guy from the Philippines that Journey got to take Steve Perry's spot. He didn't speak English, but oh, he could no. phonetically sing the fucking notes. She's right? better than that. She actually studied English. So oh, well, she she was studied it doing what? Was she sitting there watching it being disemboweled? Of all the things to critique this segment for, these aren't even the ones. This segment well, no, was... I'm, I'm, I'm just starting at the top. What was this segment? Whose idea was this segment? That's uh, apparently theirs. She can't pronounce English. Maria cannot act. Uh, Mina's facials, when she's not shaking and laughing look like she's completely baffled at everything that's going on around her. And the thing is, Maria does... Well, yeah, actually, except if I was involved in it, that'd be what I was most puzzled about. Why am I in the middle of this? But Maria says that Mina is her one true friend. They're just like family. She couldn't have done it without her. And then they drink champagne with their arms interlocked. And then Mina starts screaming. And, I mean, screaming and screeching and it's a, ah, like that. Whatever her scripted lines are. And then as she goes over to the middle of the stage and starts doing a stripper dance without taking anything off. Maria takes the champagne bottle and starts sneaking up behind her her best friend, her bosom buddy. And then uh, Mina turns around and Maria swings and Mina ducks. And then they stare at each other. And then Mina spin kicks the bottle away and they stare at each other again. And then Maria spits on Mina. More staring. And then Mina tackles Maria off the stage onto a table which doesn't break, and then they slide off onto the second one, which just collapses in the middle. Like it was the first one was concrete and the second one was balsa wood. And then they both lay there while everybody's running up to see if they're okay. And then Mina gets up with fake blood coming from her mouth. And she's screaming and st starts chewing on Maria's head. And then the end. What? When she kicked that bottle out of her hand, <laughs> I said, this is amazing. This, these women are allowed to do whatever the fuck they want on this show. And they're going out there and these are, I like this stuff better than the Mercedes Monet stuff. This weird they're the love of each other's lives. And then I mean, she was ready to throw her off that stage or throw herself off that stage right away. Well, yes. I mean, they, they were ready to just to do the Thelma and Louise off the cliff. I, I, I don't know. What did the, uh, who wants to. Now this is going to lead to a match between them from this long friendship that we just learned about, what, two months ago? Seriously, they should just make Mina like the host of the show, like downtown Julie Brown or something. <laughs> like at random times throughout the show, she's just standing in the crowd talking to you, shaking her tits, because she likes to, and that's it. You have the promise of seeing her several times on the show, but none of these kind of segments or none of these matches. I think that would work better. Plus, it gets the hosting duties away from some of these other people. 
Well, maybe they could make it Danny Garcia's mother could be the host. Oh, I don't, that's not nice. Well, no, she figured prominently in the, in the video they did. Well, it was her narration. That's right. Yes, because she left him a voicemail where she gave him like a two-minute pep talk on life. And they, they have a video of this bland, boring bowl of fucking oatmeal with no sugar wearing fucking headphones with mope face on standing at various fucking public monuments listening apparently to his mother's inspirational voicemail. And uh, that's, that's, uh, I guess that's another way they can try to get him over and fail. Cause uh, goodness gracious on a Ritz cracker. What? See, now you need to heal the feud with them and they do a video where they're in various locations and they're playing their text <laughs> messages and voicemails. And it's, you know, when can we meet up? Fuck me. You know, just like all <laughs> sorts of things like that. <laughs> the takeaway from all the seriousness. Hey, hey, I t it's going to be better in this upcoming match. So I'll tell this story again real quick. I've told it before, but it's been a while. But Tony Schiavone, when he was with Crockett, after he came back from, the, from Vince when Turner had bought the company. So it was with Turner. 1990. Tech, 1990. He's doing a lot of, you know, office work as well as the announcing and et cetera. He's doing some of the paperwork and working with the commissions or this and that, whatever he's doing. He's got him a handheld audio uh, tape recorder that he, he'll sit in a locker room and he'll like play his notes back like, Call Sting at hotel under name Steve Borden. <laughs> Check on Sting's rental car. Or call, you know, uh, fucking uh, Anderson under name Lundy. And, you know, check this and that. So we waited until he'd gone out to do one of the TV tapings. And Stan got a hold of his fucking handheld recorder, right? So now we find out later on, several days later, he was at home with his wife, Lois, and I think he had like eight kids or whatever. He's got a multitude of children, and they were all very young at the time, and he's sitting around the fireplace in his little home in Charlotte, and he's listening to that tape transcribing his notes, and all of a sudden a voice comes on, call Bobby Eaton at hotel under name Eaton, E-A-T-O-N, suck Bobby's dick <laughs> call Stan Lane <laughs> under name Lane L A N E lick Stan's balls. <laughs> <laughs> he came out. He said, "Well, Lois didn't appreciate." Me. Gave her some ideas. And it, well, I'm now. I'm not gonna say anything about anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll save another story about Shivani for a later date. So we had the video of Garcia with the audio from his mom giving him advice. They're stealing. From, yes, stealing, as the big cat would say. They're stealing. Well, with Trent's mother has already done an angle. Now it's Danny's mother. I thought, I, you know, they're all stealing my gimmick. I was the only one that was the mama's boy in the wrestling business. Well, you did it right. You actually made it work. You can critique these other guys in the way they've used their uh, mamas. You never even had to use your mama. You just yeah, had to I never say your know. name. I use your mama. <laughs> yeah. Nobody ever saw my mama. You just had to say your name. I just had to talk about her. Didn't even need to show up. For the TNT title, Danny Garcia versus Jack Perry. And at that point, I know that we are two hours and 15 minutes into this pay-per-view and three hours and 45 minutes with the preview and or the pre-show or pre-whatever it was. And they get on the floor again and Knox is the referee again. So you're not going to get any semblance of anything. And at, at one point early on, old Jungle Jackoff power-bombed Garcia over the railing, through a table, and then buried him in garbage. Which was kind of an apropos there. There's a line there somewhere. And he was there, uh, buried in garbage on the floor for a couple minutes without getting counted out for a 10 count. I mean, it's, a, it's two guys that 
You know, Jungle Jack has driven off more people than he ever brought to begin with, and the whole punk thing was the end of him because the people that left were like they blamed him, and the people that are still around but remember when it was better blame him. And he's not a badass. He's he's seen the movie where he's some kind of psycho killer. <laughs> And a what? psycho, the first part I'll fucking buy, but not kill her. Were you trying to do the talking head song, or those are just noises associated with a psycho? Killer? Those were those were uh, both. You know that. No, that no was it a, was not that both. Was, no, it was a true to life story. But certainly not the song. They were writing about the 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 woman that got killed on Love Roller Coaster when the Ohio players were in the studio next to the woman that was screaming because she was being murdered. What? They then wrote the, the song Psycho Killer about that. Uh, 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 uh. That's the, but that's not how that... I don't even know if this story you just told is true, but that's certainly not how the song goes. You never heard that the Ohio players on Roller Coaster of Love say what? You never... the One of the screams in there, the, the urban legend in 1977 or so, was that that was the scream from a girl in the studio next door who was killed by a vicious knife-wielding murderer and her screams were caught on tape listen to the song i've never heard that uh first of all second of all i know that the talking heads were not in the studio next to them recording talking head 77 i know no, that's where they they stole it from they they recorded the song psycho killer about the psycho killer that was next to the studio where the ohio players were doing i just googled it and uh, i have an ai overview supplied by google there's an urban legend that a woman was murdered in the studio while the ohio players recorded the song love roller coaster Uh for their album honey say what The, <laughs> the legend claims that the scream on the track was from Esther Corday, or Cordet, the nude model on the album cover. Yeah. Who was stabbed by a band member, manager, or engineer. The legend has many variations, including she was complaining about the honey and fiberglass she was sitting on t- during the photo shoot which permanently damaged her legs and ruined her modeling career. Well, how would that have happened if she, you know, she got kissed? She sat down on the shit and then they killed her. The honey used in the photo shoot was actually an acrylic substance. Another urban legend is a woman fell off a roller coaster and the scream was captured on tape and added to the recording. And finally, the woman saw a rabbit killed outside the studio during the recording. (laughs) But it says that, urban legend. That one didn't get a lot of traction. Well, that's, you know, it's, it's the mainstream media, Brian. You got to know, you can't believe CNN and NBC and MSNBC and the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Atlanta Constitution and CBS News and Time Magazine. You got to go to the real sources, like the people that, Talk about the woman that got murdered yeah. in the studio next to Ohio players. Yeah, by the way, how sick would that be? That would be a much bigger story. The woman was murdered. Then what happened? Then they took a nude photo of her and put her on the album cover, covered in honey. And then they put her scream on the title track or the biggest hit single they ever had. Well, see, at least it worked out that she was remembered. All right, so it's been about nine minutes since we started talking about Garcia versus Okay, well, about, Jungle 15, Jack. about 15 minutes into this thing... <laughs> Perry brings the title belt in, and the referee stands there and stares at him. And Perry gives Garcia the belt and says, hit me, hit me with it. And the announcers are saying, he doesn't need to win that way. Well, he wouldn't win that way anyway. If he hits him with it in front of the referee, the referee ought to disqualify him. But the referee should have disqualified the guy for bringing the fucking object into the ring to begin with, because he's standing there looking at him. So... Garcia overacts and is conflicted and then grabs the belt and gives it to the referee. And of course, I mentioned it's the corpse referee, Rick Knox. So instead of just holding it and keeping his eyes on what's going on like a normal human would do, he takes the belt and walks across the ring and is handing it out at his... He will not turn around so that Perry can then give uh, Danny the nut shot and in a big knee, and get a two count. 
So now their balls are invulnerable. He kicked him right in the fucking balls. What if he doesn't have any? <sighs> you got me there. Then it wouldn't hurt. And then moments later, the guy who got kicked in the balls, Garcia, gets up and gives Jungle Jack off a pile driver. He gets a two count. And then Garcia chops Perry about 15 times over and over, bang, bang, and he's laying him into the chops, and Perry's laughing at him. This little weaselly chicken shit motherfucker doesn't realize that if he's going to be a heel, it would be a gold mine for him to quit trying to look like goddamn Bomba the Jungle Boy and be a little pretty boy dipshit Hollywood entitled wannabe fucking celebrity trading on his father's fame and begging off from the big mean men that want to beat him up and he could probably get some fucking heat. But instead, he wants to look like you know, fucking Ted Nugent in his goddamn Wango Tango period with the hair and at 168 pounds or whatever, he wants to laugh at people that are beating the shit out of him. And then Garcia pal drove him again and then put him in the sharpshooter. And Perry tapped out. So a pile drive, multiple pile drivers didn't work on either guy, but that sharpshooter, that's some bad shit. They do that because their favorite wrestler did that. So that means it's a more devastating thing than having a hand grenade shoved up your ass with the pin pulled. I don't worry about that, but the sharpshooter. So Garcia is the new champion of whatever the fuck they were going for there. You know, again, I've been saying it over and over. This match went way too long. The crowd was not into it for a variety of reasons including the people in this. Got a nice pop at the end when Garcia finally won, but I think a lot of these pops, too, were like, they were happy the match was over. And Yes, relief pop. You know, for every complaint you've made over the years about various guys in AEW, Orange Cassidy's still there. A lot of people that aren't even there anymore. They're cosplay wrestlers, they're play wrestlers. I don't think there's anyone that exemplifies that more than Jack Perry because of the gimmick. If you took this gimmick, and I'll use a name I used months ago when talking about Jack Perry stuff, if you put it on a Nick Camarado or a big guy where they're talking shit yeah. while they're getting beat up and they're driving around in a fucking shitty van and they're talking gibberish like they're fucking raving about sacrificing something for whoever for no good reason, it would be something. Somebody intimidating. When it's someone smaller than the average listener's kids... There's a problem. Again, if he was going to be a chicken shit heel the same way Adam Cole should be, that's one thing. Give him a valet. Let him be a chicken shit. But I guess that's not cool enough. Instead, he has to be something he clearly isn't. And also what he isn't is over. No one gives a shit. And I think Daniel Garcia, you know, and it's kind of the story, the underlying story of the show you know, Daniel Garcia here, Will or Yuta later, AEW has doubled down and tripled down on these two guys that came in around the same time that have not picked up any muscle mass, any size, they haven't filled out, and because people there like them, they're used in roles they're not ready for and that people aren't going to take to them in. Garcia has a little bit of grace with the fans. It can run out real quickly. His promos are, they're not for me. I'll say that. <laughs> they're not. And again, he's another really small guy. He looks bigger because he's in there with a guy like Jack Perry. But he's another skinny, slim guy with no muscle mass. So I think that's, you know, they just signed he's him to the deal. That's why I thought he was going to win. And he did. You could get a little wiry 140 pound motherfucker that if he was nuts, you'd believe he'd try to gouge your eyes out. But this fucking inoffensive little milk toast motherfucker is just what? No. He's acting like Bruiser Brody. He's not as tough as Howard Brody. <laughs> now. But it now. Yeah. Howard could still take you, you little prick. Or at least talk you to sleep. Well, one or the other. You might you might pray for relief. <laughs> you might 
He might read you 1992 from his notes. But again, there's a difference between Garcia, who at least the fans have kind of gotten behind at times, and he's a little bit bigger than Jack Perry, who it kind of worked as Jungle Boy, although they did not do everything right and it did not go all the way, because the character was that he was a little Jungle Boy. You get a little baby face, you get sympathy, but what, what is the scapegoat and what is his yeah. fixation on the transportation? And by the way, he's the scapegoat. Why did he come out in a goat mask? Is there any <laughs> reason that the scapegoat, like, they call me a scapegoat, I'll dress like a goat. What the fuck is that? Yeah, I don't think he understands the meaning, uh, <laughs> the meaning of the word scapegoat. But also, why does the scapegoat who's from Hollywood and had a TV star or movie star father have to drive around in a black painted used bread truck? See, that's it, it's just because it's cool for him to drive up in it and they can hit it with things and everything, but it doesn't make any sense and it's never explained. See, that's a move for some heel to do a good pro. Like MJF a couple years ago would have been like prime guy to do the promo. You know, you all got a problem with me because I flash the fact that I make money and I drive fancy cars. All these posers in the locker room, Moxley, Jack Perry, Darby, they're all millionaires and they're pretending that they're slumming it. <laughs> Get out of here. Be yourselves. Put on a tuxedo. <laughs> all right, well, speaking of putting on a tuxedo, I think maybe, you know, Ricochet, if oh. you dressed him up as a penguin, I think that would be the gimmick. I can see him coming out and, 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 and being dressed like a penguin, can't you? It sounded ridiculous, and as you're saying it, I'm picturing it. I, Chili you Willy was on. It now. Chili Willy. This was a special added attraction, a surprise match. Yes. <laughs> and then the length of it was another surprise. And there was another one. It went 20 minutes. Well, that's a, we, and we laughed when we previewed the show. We said they'll probably add another match like the, on the pre-show. And I don't know when they added this, but it wasn't much before that. Ricochet versus Take a Shit for whatever reason we don't know. Otherwise, then they added it and they gave it 20 minutes or so to, to percolate. And it, it's a, it was a TV match. Again, I, and the same thing. They had a long fight on the floor to start out. And referee Aubrey Ed was standing there, muzzled as usual, shaking her head, doing nothing. Same as the crowd, doing nothing. And it was the same shit that everybody but MJF had been doing all night. But, you know, now he, here's the thing. Take, with good booking and a manager who actually managed and talked about him, and in the traditional sense was his manager, to do interviews on a weekly basis on television for him and his ongoing programs, where he would have been brought in and gotten over as one of the top heels and then interact with the other main event guys, that world, he could be a main event guy here. I can buy it. He's big enough. He's good enough. We've seen short bursts. We've seen that he can go in the ring and he's worth more and probably getting paid a lot less than every other Japanese import they've signed for big money. So if, if those parameters that I just mentioned had been met, he's a main event guy. Ricochet is not going to be a main event guy here. He does the same shit that the base core audience that's never going to leave likes, all the high-flying, aerobatic type of stuff, but he can't talk. There's no real personality there. There's no size, and he can do the the flying, which... They've gone through 15 other people that can do from England, Mexico, Tasmania, and wherever. So there's another high-priced fellow that has settled firmly into the middle of the card. And then when they ran out of shit to do back and forth to each other, Ricochet went to the top and take a shit just stopped him and gave him a superplex and pinned him one, two, three. So again, another heel just out-wrestled a baby face, didn't cheat, and management didn't interfere. Who does these fucking finishes? But they was the right finish because Take a Shit has more upside than Ricochet right now. I don't know, you tell me. 
No, he clearly does. And, you know, you talk about the other Japanese wrestlers that AEW assign. He's clearly, I think, the most valuable one out of all of them. And he's also the one you'd probably not want WWE to sign the most. He was and, and probably the only one that you would have to worry the WWE would sign. That, well, right now, I don't think they're signing Ishii or Ibushi. <laughs> can't walk. He was the right guy to win, but this was the wrong match to have a 20-minute match here this late in the show. Well, it was built up so carefully by <laughs> how? There was, a, there was an eight-man all-star match. I guess they were both on opposite sides of that. So that Oh, uh, that's right. Yes, yes. But that's the thing. If you're going to do a surprise match like this late in the card, and it goes 20 minutes after every match has gone 20 minutes with diminishing returns from the crowd in terms of noise, energy, and attention... You got to rethink things. And what would, would, if you're going to put Takeshita over anyway, and it's AEW and Takeshita beating Ricochet won't even hurt Ricochet, why not just do this in five minutes and make it as fast and action packed and exciting as you can for five minutes? Then it has some impact. Oh shit, did you see that? Best five minutes on the show. Instead, it was another endless match. Well, or they could have saved it for TV and had 20 minutes of them on television where the TV show is not allowed to run for five and a half hours because at that point, we were three hours into the pay-per-view, four and a half hours total, and we've still got the double main events coming up. And they, they oh, here, have this one. Did you know? There, there's more of it. Did you know it was a double main event? Did you know Swerve Lashley was one of the main events? Because I didn't know it until they said it on the pay-per-view. Well, I think they pretty much figured out that, boy, looking at that card, we've made a mistake with our world title match, and nobody gives a shit about most anything else, so <laughs> maybe they'll be interested in Swerve and Lashley. And I can't say it was not misplaced. Because, and I mean, remember, Swerve was the the guy that was just kicking ass and winning everything and doing everything and then the people started liking him and instantly as soon as they realized the people started liking him everybody beat the shit out of swerve he got everything taken away from him and then he switched back heel again we thought and people kind of liked him again but then now they just like to yell swerve's house when nana yells whose house and otherwise they're not yelling much and there's not many people in the house and this is what I was talking about earlier, is that Swerve versus Lashley, great main event, great pay-per-view match, not this quick. And, and, the, and with what they've done on television, I made mockery of it the other day when Swerve came out and knocked Lashley on his ass twice the third week he's been on television or whatever. And then... You knew that Lashley had to win this match because it's too early for him to get beat, but it's too early for him to have a match with Swerve. They were going for, if Swerve and Lashley were equivalently over in their world, yeah, on their roster, in their presentation, and then, boy, we have this big match, but Lashley just got there, and they've done damage to Swerve with the booking to where Swerve is, is still at a point where he needs to look fairly strong because he's had a lot taken away from him. But Lashley can't be selling now because he just got there and he's the biggest beast in the fucking zoo. So don't have this match right now. Have Lashley against a mid-card babyface in his first pay-per-view appearance that he can fucking demolish. And... <clears throat> They just, they have no patience and they don't know how to time anything or how to get somebody in and get them over to a level. And again, for the people who didn't hear it, I'm not saying Lashley's not over with wrestling fans. More people know who he is than most people on this show. But in this environment, position him. How are we to take him as viewers? And when he, again, he, in front of 600,000 people on TV, Swerve just knocked him on his ass and made bumblefucks out of his manager and partner. And for a sixth of that audience, Bobby Lashley beats the shit out of Swerve. 
You're supposed to want to pay to see the baby face get even. <laughs> Which means you do the angle where you get the heat on the heel in front of the most people. Then didn't make them pay to say. <sighs> now, having said all that about the timing, this was probably the best match on the show for business reasons, for accomplishing something, for the rights of finish, and for, you know, both guys involved being main event level talent in this situation. And Lashley was dominant through most of it and manhandled Swerve and Swerve fought from underneath and both of their stuff looked good. Nobody looked like they was silly or fucking they didn't stand there and allow each other to be chopped. Lashley's not going to go for that. He's too smart for that. And they did a little business with Shelton where he tried to interfere a couple times and they kicked him out of ringside. And then Swerve had to fight later on in the match to really open up and get his shit. And then he jumped off the the stairs and double stomped Lashley through the Spanish announce desk, which looked great to me. And that's kind of if that if that had been the only time we'd seen a human being, male or female, fly through a fucking table or a desk that night. Wow, can you imagine? But it was only, it was like number five or whatever. But then, you know, he gets a two count with a double stomp. And then Lashley rolls to the floor and belly to belly swerve on the floor and speared him through the railing. And then got back in the ring and speared him again and got the hurt lock on him and a referee rang the bell. It wasn't too long. It wasn't silly. They didn't try to recreate their Japanese wrestling hero's signature moves. Swerve was the agile, you know, uh, gymnastic type because that's his style, but Lashley kept him grounded enough that it didn't get ridiculous. And, you know, again, it was a great debut for Lashley to get him over to face a top guy, but he was already in the ring with a top guy. And, you know, I just wish the timing had been better for this match. They they could have run Swerve and Shelton for a pay-per-view match and maybe even a couple, you know, six weeks on TV, and then here comes Lashley, and you got, but whatever. And then they rolled Nana in, and he begged and groveled, and and then they hurt locked Nana. But can they please let Nana just say, "Fuck it, I'm going to go down swinging and throw a couple punches," because he's a babyface manager. People are supposed to like him, and they don't like cowards and people who don't help their friends out. Uh, but uh, but uh, do you agree with me that based on this field? That if Bobby Lashley had not debuted with the way Shelton Benjamin has looked, you gonna tell me that Shelton versus Swerve couldn't have been a pay-per-view match to lead to the next big pay-per-view with Swerve versus Lashley? Potentially. I mean, there's a whole lot of done wrong here. And I don't think Swerve's booking, despite him getting over with the fans, which you know, it's kind of going the other way, it seems like, at certain points lately. But despite that, the booking around them has been horrible. Nothing makes any real sense. Things are escalated to ridiculous degrees <laughs> for no good reason. And he's eaten a couple of pins lately. With that said, going into this, Lashley needed to go out there and just destroy him. Yeah. He needs to destroy everyone in his way right now. So when I say there's a whole lot of nothing good here... The match shouldn't have happened. Now, they did Swerve and Shelton on TV a few weeks ago. So, obviously, you couldn't bring that back. And Well, yeah, no, but that's what I mean. If they'd have started out with the thought that we're going to... MVP is going to bring in Shelton, and Shelton and Swerve are going to have a problem and an ongoing issue leading to a pay-per-view match, and then we'll put Swerve over, but here comes Lashley. Then they could have got more time to build everything and Shelton wouldn't have been K 
cast aside so quickly and you'd get more mileage. And I worry about Sheldon right now because I see that he's in the Continental Classic tournament. So either oh Christ, either he's going to win or he's about to eat a bunch of pins in the tournament from people that you're like, how the fuck is he in there with this guy? How's it competitive? But, you know, the other thing is with Lashley, with Shelton and with MVP out here, every time we've seen them in front of the camera at the press scrum where they stole the show. They're always dressed like star athletes. You know, the star athlete typically throughout history didn't walk around dressed like a bum. (laughs) Usually either the team required there to be a dress code or they just realized I don't want to look like a bum. Wrestlers, there's a lot of wrestlers who are multimillionaires who still think, you know, I want to dress like a bum. I guess for the bum credibility. It's a big, the bum audience is a big demo. But every time you see Lashley, MVP, and Shelton, they're dressed like star athletes. They dress like stars. They carry themselves that way. What's MVP stand for? Uh, Montavious, well, no, voluminous. I mean, yeah, al- allegedly, but the Porter? play on word MVP, most valuable player. Right, right. Talking about blue chip what? athletes. What does it stand for? Babies. What does it stand for? What is his name? Tell me his name. Montel Vontavious Porter. Is that it? That's it. It's Montel, it is. It's huh. not Montel, it is. It's Montel. No, I, that, I meant I didn't realize it was my. He never says his. He says his. his he never says his, his he, name. He never says his, his, his name. The sad thing is, you wait for Tony to blow something when there's something that, you know, I feel like, you know, in a way, people don't go for the layup. They think they have to make things complicated, but there's a layup right here with the Hurt Syndicate, the way they carry themselves, how over Lashley has been on the shows. We'll see what they do, but... Well, the, the good thing is that with the, a lot of the other guys, most of the other guys, maybe all the other guys, except MVP, not only does Tony have input, but they also have input. And that's why a lot of this shit is well, so indie. But the problem but, is they have to work with other people. So well, but they have Michelle, input, so does Will Washington and Swerve. Well, yeah, but with, with, with MVP and Lashley and Shelton, you've got three guys who are very smart to the wrestling business and know how to present themselves and know how to get themselves over. And you can't tell everybody to do everything. Some of this stuff, even if it's booked bad, a lot of the stuff boils down to bad instincts, bad training, and bad psychology amongst the talent. And at least you don't have that with these guys. And they may they may do some stupid shit you know, like everybody else does in this company because that's the way that it's booked or that's the way that it's worked out. But nobody's going to be trading chops with Bobby Lashley and nobody's going to be fucking, you know, doing goddamn leaping tombs, tombstone pile drivers with Shelton Benjamin because they would have to allow that and they're not going to. Anyway, are you ready for the big main event, Brian? Oh, boy. This was a long show, and then came the main event, and all I'm thinking is I want to see how they're going to pull this off. Because what happened is what I thought would happen. (laughs) The fans got so behind Orange Cassidy here wanting this Moxley stuff to end that they thought it was going to happen. And quite frankly, if there was ever a time to put the belt on Orange Cassidy, and I'm not not a fan of all this with AEW, but we're thinking like, Tony, this may have been the night based on the reaction. Nah. And then it just devolved into every bad dynamite ending you've ever seen all in one match. I don't know what well, happened here. Well, first of all, they can't put the belt because they would have to live with that shame. They would have to live with that shame and infamy all through history because it would be written in their history. Pockets was the world champion. But and obviously they're setting Darby up for the thing, which... Again, there's another 140-pound guy that can beat Moxley, but at least people like him. Which thing? The wacky races idea I've had? Uh, no, but no. But everyone just driving around cars crashing into each other? That was no, my idea? No, they're, they're going to do that for free on television. But it'll, it'll eventually be Moxley and Darby for the soul of AEW somehow. Uh, but you talked about just a second ago the Hurt Syndicate dressing like stars, looking like star professional athletes. Moxley comes out dressed like he shops at homeless camps. To, he can't even, 
He used to have some type of wrestling gear, didn't he? Now he just said, fuck it, a sweatshirt and sweatpants. Uh, and he came out first, and he's the world champion, but since the building was bigger than their, or the crowd at least was bigger than their normally is on their tapings, it took him longer to get to the ring because he has to walk in from the parking lot. So the mascot came out second, and we had the world title on the line between Plumber Moxley and our little puppy Pockets. And they're doing the introduction, and at John Moxley, he didn't get Moxley out, Pockets runs over and hits him with a Superman punch. And then another one. And then another one. And then dives on him out on the floor, and they started the fight on the floor. We are five hours into this goddamn show at every single match that they have had, except for Big Boom, AJ, and the Twizzler, has had fighting on the floor. And then Pockets goes over and gets on top of Moxley on the, one of the announced desks and hits like 20 fake punches where... He's not even trying. No, they're not being registered because they're not making any contact. It's just, it's embarrassing. They fought into the arena and around the ring for minutes at a time. Another indie style garbage match because that's where their minds are at. Uh, Moxley stomps pockets into the stairs so he can get a little color. At first, it was a pap smear, but then a little bit came. Eventually, uh, let's see, Moxley DDT's pockets on the stairs. They haven't been in the ring in over five minutes at that point. Moxley pile drove pockets for a two count. So again, even this guy who looks like a just your average buggy whip armed fuck that might be at a local gym on the treadmill looking at his fucking phone. Oh, pile driver, that's a two count. And he went back to the floor and the desk and the stairs. And then Moxley would kick Pockets in the head and Pockets would ask him to do it again, so he would. And then Moxley would no-sell some of the other clown shit. And I read 12 minutes in, I wrote, it's old, it's way old. Then they traded the slaps into forearms. They had a slap fight, then the forearm thing, then... Pocket stood there and let Moxley hit him over and over. And then he put his hands in his pockets and started kicking Moxley's shin. And, uh, again, they don't. And then Pockets hit three or four Superman punches and got a two count. And that's where Claudio and Pac showed up. And then. O'Reilly and Rocky Romero and the Potato Ishii showed up and were fighting Pac and Claudio. So now three baby faces and two fucking heels. But I thought he told them, don't come out and help me. That is what he said to him. By the way, what a baby face stable to save the other guy. Oh, my God. Once Ishii's out there as the baby face making the save, it's ridiculous. Well, O'Reilly is so skinny, he looks like an asparagus sprout. You've got Ishii's a potato. If Rocky Romero could impersonate a salmon croquette, he'd have a nice little dinner there. I'm and not it, even sure if the fans know who Rocky Romero is. Because well, no, all of a sudden we, he was just standing next to yeah. these guys, and he's never really been introduced in a meaningful way. No, we, we know because he's been around for a long time, and he's wrestled in Japan. But no, he just started showing up. He's like a wedding crasher. He just showed up and mixed in, and, and nobody said anything. I wonder one of these days, is somebody going to check his papers? And then Willow Nightingale came out and tackled Marina Schaefer. And so they that had That got have, a big pop. And, well, it, yes, and they did it the right way, too. They didn't play her music. They let her just run out. But to th think about this. Marina Schaefer is the only one nobody's touched her. Nobody has had any offense on her. Nobody's done anything to her. She'd been kicking the shit out of people. That's why they popped. Because they haven't seen it. They've seen all these people be bludgeoned to death. Which is another lesson for them. 
So then Pockets got the briefcase that's allegedly supposed to have the title belt in it, but you can tell by the way they're swinging it around. That belt ain't in that case. It's an empty fucking Halliburton or whatever briefcase. Where is that belt? When was the last time we saw it? Did you think, did somebody lose it or pawn it? In Cincinnati? Hey, you never know. Maybe it was put up a, as a side bet in one of those amateur jujitsu tournaments or death jitsu. I put my belt up against your car, man. I put my belt up against that big guy over there. Oh, I lost. <laughs> I used to have a belt. All right. Yeah, there's some janitor walking around the AEW championship. Man, I won this in a jiu-jitsu tournament the other day right here in the school gym. You wouldn't no, believe the, it. The guy, the guy at Home Depot, he's got it hanging yeah. over the uh, the thing on his cart when he's pushing the lumber out to the parking lot. It's Anyway, they nailed Moxley with the briefcase, got a two count. We're 20 minutes into this thing. Then Moxley drew the referee's attention and Pockets was milking the punch, but Moxley had the referee in the way and there came Wheeler Useless into the ring and leveled Pockets with whatever and rolled out the other side. And then Moxley grabbed him and hit the fucking double arm DDT. At least he didn't drop him like he drops the Japanese guys, like they're Fabergé eggs. He dropped pockets here. Cover one, two, three, and the crowd went mild. It was like, ah. Well, and the problem was, again, like the Chris Statlander match, I think the fans there got hyped up to a point because because of what was happening and the direction it was pushing in, they thought they were going to get the title change. And not only did they not get it, but someone who isn't over in any way in Wheeler Yuta, who's being shoved down everyone's throats because John Moxley loves him. He th this is his young boy. He got to pick anyone, and he picked the guy who isn't over that no one cares about. You mean this is the guy that's washing Moxley's balls, at least whenever those balls get washed? Well, he ran in there, and he interfered, and that was the finish. So it deflated people on a number of levels, and... This may be the most one of the most deflated endings to an AEW pay-per-view ever. Well, it's not quite over yet, as we'll get to, but that's the thing. Somebody's out there going to say, well, it's, you're, you're supposed to want the challenger to win. Yes, you're supposed to always want the challenger to win and beat the champion in the normal psychology of wrestling, but not, not because, oh, God, we're so sick of this fucking goof with his fucking belt. Can this guy just fucking beat him, please, and get it off of him? That not, you know what the other thing too is. I think a lot of people don't understand history, so a lot of people are like, you know, we're just doing stuff like the Four Horsemen, you know, where we interfere and we keep the belts and we help each other. Fans got sick of the run-ins. Fans yes. got sick of the shit finishes. They expected it. They would stand up and turn. Now with Moxley's crew, obviously you have to turn and, the other and way. By the way, well, think about this: it was much less overdone and much less and much more c controlled, and they still got sick of it. So I think you know, with the Moxley stuff again, it's a slapdash crew of people: Claudio and Pac and Marina, and we were Yuta and Moxley. It's just not clicking. The ratings haven't been going up. In fact, the segments with them at the end of the show have nosedived. I think fans are ready to move on from this. AEW fans are ready to move on from this. And they had a glimmer of hope for a moment there. They lost that. And then we were you to interfered to go right to the finish, which was a <laughs> dead finish. Oh, yeah, and, then, well, and then there was a really stupid ending to the show. You're right, beyond the actual finish of the match. Well, yeah, this is where I'm going to enlist your help here real quick. Because, okay, Moxley, DDT, one, two, three. We're back where we started from. Moxley's the champion. And then Moxley and Wheeler grab pockets and hold him down and pour a bottle of bleach in his face. What? <laughs> when a plastic bag just won't do. <laughs> Unless we're going to have a bleach on a pole match. Why was that necessary? Tony, is it okay if I feed him some Drano? Yeah, sure, John, whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sounds great. So they pour the bottle of bleach <laughs> in his face, and, and the announcer said, oh, my God, that's why they clean the ring surface with that. Uh, and you can smell the, the, the caustic chemicals. And... Hangnail Adam Page comes in, hits the ring, and hits Wheeler with a chair. 
And then Moxley and Page face off. So is, is Page is taking up for pockets? He's saving him? Is he coming back to take up for AEW? But before we can figure that out, Christian Cage comes in, who we know is a heel, and hits his finish on Moxley. And he's dropped the the clipboard or the metal case that the contract for an AEW world title match that he's got is in. So Page hands, reluctantly, hands Christian Cage the contract case and leaves. So he came out just to hit a guy with a fucking chair and then left. And then Christian goes to cash in because he's laid Moxley, the other heel, out with his finish, but Jay White comes in, who is a babyface, we think, who fought Adam Page earlier in the night, but since Page is gone, White hits his finish on Christian Cage, but then Claudio and Pac come back in and beat up Jay White, and then all of Moxley's crew gathers together and leaves the arena. And... The fans are standing there going, is that it? And then you you cut to Moxley and his crew in the garage and they're in their truck or their parking lot, the parking area. And they're going to leave, but a car runs into their pickup truck that they run around in the desert in. A car runs into it and knocks it sideways, so they turn around give a big boot to the valet parking guy, grab a, a, a set of car keys hanging on a hook, and immediately the car, is, the SUV is right there, and they've grabbed the right keys, and they jump in that and carjack that vehicle to get out of there, <laughs> which, by the way, anybody that's ever valet parked a car knows it takes the valet 10 minutes to find your fucking keys. He's the one that put them there. And then as they steal the SUV and leave, it's Darby Allen in the car that ran into their truck and he jumps out. That's right. You fucking leave, you fucking cowards. And he goes and tries to beat up their pickup truck <laughs> with his skateboard and quickly finds out, I don't know how it used to be, but now that they got safety glass and the like, you can't do a lot of damage to a pickup truck with a fucking skateboard. But he was trying. So He was bleeding, too. Did he really just... Did they say I, just crash that car into that car no matter what? I guarantee you that he crashed the car into the other car and hit the fucking windshield, because they're all idiots. And they think they can just do this shit, because well, we've established Darby's not that smart. But anyway, so I don't know what Adam Page was doing in there. He just stopped in to fucking hit a guy with a chair and then stare at Moxley and leave. See, that was intriguing for a second. It was like, okay, it's, this is different. I didn't even think about the idea of Moxley versus Adam Page. That's a interesting term. And then once Christian comes in and then Jay White, it was just too much. <laughs> just people for no, like just one after another and nothing was happening. Christian never cashes in this thing. Why did they have to copy money in the bank? Whose idea was it? Hey, well, we need money in the bank. And then Christian will keep teasing this thing forever. As if he's not annoying enough. Besides that, why didn't we get to see whether they were pumping Darby, uh, not Darby, pumping pockets his stomach or not because he uh, swallowed a half pint of bleach? What? Uh, where, how did he get out of there? Was he blinded? Did the bleach eat his retinas and they had to carry him out? What? People just disappear when their scene is no longer, you know, uh, active. So it's just a mess. You know, again, the 30 minutes to get the fucking match and the entrance is out of the way, and then the bleach attack, and then the run in, and then run in number two, and then run in number three, and then run into in the parking lot with the car and the fucking. Uh... And that was the end of that. So to my idea earlier of AEW Dynamite becoming less about wrestling, more about wacky races, wacky races. and tits, <laughs> you know, I joke, but I think we're on the road there. Everyone has what a car. What about wacky tits? 
Uh, I don't, you know, it sounds better in concept than I think it would play out in theory. Or you may be right. Or an execution, I guess, is the word I'm looking for there. But speaking of wacky tits, Tony Khan, another another pay per view. Everything's great. Everything's wonderful. But you know, the pay per views. I'll be surprised if this isn't the lowest buy rate, legitimately, based despite whatever they put out there, because we've been able to determine. Tony and AEW are full of shit when it comes to public information. But the fan interest and then the just the interest of the fans that actually went there, it's getting close to being non-existent. I'm, I'm just... It, 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 someone besides us, maybe they won't listen to us, but someone is bringing up many, if not all, of these same points one would have to think. Somebody somewhere that they listen to or that they talk to, maybe without listening, is saying some of the same things and they choose instead to do more of the same thing and more of the same thing is running people off. You got to pick the right talent. You got to do the right things with the right talent. And then the talent has to be given the opportunity to do, to get over on their own. And all those things have to go hand in hand. And they started with a gimme because of the incredible heat that the WWE had with a large group of wrestling fans. And they were willing to give the new thing, you know, a look and a try and a, a chance. And, you know, that new thing did a million to a, a little over a million people on television. And now it's doing a little over half of that because they stopped being mad at the other company that makes all the stars and, and they ran all the stars off of this company and replaced them with children that it's visually ridiculous to look at. And it, like I said, Hollywood casting, y'all want to be directors, producers, cinematographers, actors, stars. You got to have somebody doing the casting. And they have to look the fucking part. Well, there's a lack of that show wide, but you know, there's some promise. I mean, you got to think you got to hope that MVP Lashley and Shelton won't be involved in too much stupid stuff. But again, Swerve and his team and their booking has had a lot of problems. MJF. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm going to be hopeful that maybe all this Adam Cole, Kyle O'Reilly stuff is a ticket out of the MJF involvement, <laughs> but we'll see. But the Moxley stuff, it's killing the shows. It's killing the spirit. It's bad. Guys, out there in his green corduroys wrestling the fuck out of here. 